Welcome to Vantage Fishing Radio, where we discuss the hot bite and all things fishing. With your hosts, Dustin Clark and Lewis Chapman. Fish on. Welcome back to Vantage Fishing Radio. So tonight I'm with uh, John Schneider. John, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing tonight, Liz? Pretty good. Pretty good. So uh, filling in for Dustin, some big shoes, huh? Uh, I'm trying. So it's good to have you back on. So the last time we had you on was at the Ice Fishing Roundtable? Yep, that's correct. So... Um, yeah, so we've done a few episodes since then. We're on episode 14. So I just want to welcome everybody that's listening and uh, downloading. I think the podcast or radio show is now available at nine or 10 different sources. Um, Anchor and iTunes are where it's most viewed or most viewed or uh, listened to. You can actually view it on YouTube, speaking of viewing. I've been uh, uploading them all to there as a video, so if you want to watch it there. And I'm actually working on trying to get it closed captioned as, as a request. So something that's currently in the works for those people that would like closed captioning on this, um, we're, we're definitely working on it and whatnot. But uh, tonight, uh, so kind of a little bit of a loose format, just John and I talking a lot of yep. fish in. And uh, we'll actually get into a little bit about uh, Boulder Middle Creek. We got a, a big project going there that uh, Trout Unlimited is going to tell us all about. And then uh, we were going to talk a little bit about splake and uh, a lot of splake being caught through the ice lately. So we figured we'd give that fish a little bit of a rundown. So, you don't hear a whole lot about them. So. No, no, kind of a rare fish. Uh, for a long time, it was a bucket, bucket list fish of mine and I uh, was able to scratch that one off and have caught a few more since then. So uh, definitely a fun one to get to. But, um, well, how about we get at it? So let's jump into Sounds segment good. one, John. Cool. Okay. So cool. first segment tonight. Uh, just doing a little bit open forum. We're just going to chit chat a little bit. So John and I talked a little bit on the phone and uh, a little bit beforehand, and it sounds like you got a, a a new gig going right this winter because you were working the forest service. Is that correct? And now you've yep. got your winter gig. Yep. Um, you kind of found a you know a little bit more of a sustainable uh, winter job at <clears throat> Jack's Home and Ranch. Um, I I applied at the fishing department, but uh, this time of the year is a little slow for them. <laughs> Just you know, with all the ice fishermen out there keeping themselves busy. Um, but you know, it's, it's a great schedule, great coworkers, uh, just a great all around place to work. Um, and I'm not going to complain about the employee discount either for, uh, fishing stuff. <laughs> yeah, uh, that always helps. And those Jack stores, I don't know if anybody's ever been to them, but especially the one in the original one in Fort Collins, it's got such a cool layout and it's like kind of multi-building ish and, and it's just a cool feel. It's a really cool store and it's actually got a pretty good fishing selection. Um, so, I mean, is there, is that your like kind of go-to store since you're up there in the Fort Collins area? Um, yeah. I mean, Shields, if you have, you know, 25, 30 minutes to spare going one way, that's, that's going to be your, your good bet just because their selection is going to be so much larger. They have a larger store and, and whatnot. But, um, if, if you don't have any time, Jax is going to be your number one best bet in, in town here from in Fort Collins for bait, for, for just about anything, um, they usually always have it, and uh, they're always friendly, and they're open till eight, so uh, it's pretty late. So, so you mentioned bait. So what all do they carry as far as live bait? Um, I believe they carry small, medium, large shiners. Um, I believe they uh, carry suckers, if I'm not, or uh, no, the mud puppies, I believe. Um, okay. And then your, you know, your red wax worms, your normal wax worms, and then uh, night crawlers and the smaller worms. So, and and just a little bit of a, a sidetrack off of bait. I was seeing right. a Facebook post just a few days ago where people were griping about the price of water dogs. It was like eight ninety nine a piece or something like that. Yeah, and I was like, dang, who's paying eight ninety nine to catch a pike? I who's know. doing that? Raise your hand out there. Send us a comment. Tell us why you prefer water dogs and why you're willing to spend that much uh, to use water dogs to go after pike through the ice. Right. I've never really used them. I don't know if I have the heart to use them. I, what do you think about all that? Well, uh, I mean, my whole pike background 
uh, kind of centers around ice fishing in Nebraska. Um, that was when we would always catch the most pike, uh, just because it was easy to target them. We'd catch, you know, quite a few in the, in the summertime, but we were usually catching them when we were catfishing. Um, but during the winter time, I mean, our number one go-to bait was a jig head with a dead smelt from the grocery store that cost six ninety nine for a bag of like 50 or a hundred of them. And yeah. you'd throw them out on the ice. You'd let them kind of, you know, stink up and soften up a little bit. And then you'd put them on the jig head and put them down a foot underneath the bottom. And I mean, I've caught more pike in my life than I don't even know what to do with. And that was just in the little 13 year period that I lived in Nebraska. Yep. Um, so with this whole water dog thing, you know, people, yeah, I know they work and the pike here in Colorado are a little bit more difficult and skittish. So therefore it might work a little better, but I mean, I don't think a pike would ever turn down a free meal sitting on the bottom either. So, you, you know, you brought up the smelt and that was kind of cool that you did. Um, one of my greatest memories ice fishing with my dad was that every year he would call my grandfather up in Minnesota and smelt was easily available up there in the kind of the late eighties, early nineties when we used to do a lot of it together. And so the, he would send smelt down on dry ice from Minnesota and my dad would freeze it up and then we would go out to 11 mile and we would just clean house on the pike with tippets and smelt um, okay. out there. And we never used a water dog and some of the best pike fishing I ever had was with that smelt. So it's still, yeah. it definitely works here. It does. So, but um, yeah. So what else uh, you got to, uh, to, to say about Jax? Um, you know, other than, you know, the products and stuff, the, just the staff and the employees, you know, everybody has a good mood, you know, and everybody for, in general, you know, loves their job. And that's something that you, you don't really find in a whole lot of places, you know, that, that the general, um, the general employees that work there, they, they love their job and they love what they do. And yeah. that's pretty cool to see that passion. So. And they generally go the extra mile for the, the customer and they, they offer some unique stuff. And I don't know if they still do it up at Fort Collins, but I used to go up to Red Feathers a lot more than I do now. Um, and usually on my way up, I'd always stop at Jack's and get, you know, my millworms or whatever I was going to get. And the, one of the cool things at the front door is they always had a guy up there sh with a, a grinding wheel and he would sharpen knives for oh, yeah. five bucks while you're in shopping. And it was always the sharpest knife I got back. I used to love that service. I've actually yes, got a ton yeah. of knives I need to take in. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yep. I, I think that's really, really cool um, personally. But um, with that employee discount, now, is there a big ticket item or, or something you're looking for fishing um, from the store there? Yeah, speaking of which, um, it's been a long time coming, but <clears throat> I think this spring I'm going to be uh, able to finally purchase my first kayak. And that's been something that I've been kind of keeping my eyes on a little more serious in the last two years. And uh, it's something that, you know, with, with being local Fort Collins, um, Horse Tooth Reservoir is literally – less than two miles down the street and I can be there in probably four and a half minutes. And, uh, it's, it's time to have a kayak. So, um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited uh, about that. And, uh, you know, all the options and everything, you know, I think I have a couple, a couple options now, but you know, for us bigger guys, I really want to find something that can carry a six foot seven, 260 pounder <laughs> and uh, not be scared of a little wind. Cause I'm, I'm going to be beating that thing up. So, so what's, what's at the top of your list? What, what kind of kayak are you looking for? It, it's, it's, it's kind of a draw between a couple different ones. Um, but I mean the Hobie, obviously uh, it's probably the number one kayak out there. Um, but it's probably also the number one highest costing kayak. Yeah. Um, so, so that's <laughs> something, you know, that, that deters just about anybody. Um, but then, uh, just a couple, um, oh man, I, I don't have the list on me right now of, of that stuff. I was messing with that the other day. I just put it away as wishful thinking. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, but, there's one, what's really cool about kayaks is there's a lot of great brands and there's all sorts yeah. of different like propulsions, like whether it's pedal drive or you're using your oars and um, yeah. some of them you can even put batteries and a little uh, electric trolling motor on, but then you got to register it. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different options. I, I imagine like the Hobie and their, their kind of um, pedal drive. I, I don't know the exact name of it. So those kayakers are going to probably be mad at me on that one. But um, would probably be a good idea for 
the distances you'd have to cover there in horse tooth. Yep. And that's the thing, you know, I, the, the lake is incredibly long. If, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong, I believe it's uh, nine miles long. And uh, you know, there's just, there's so many places to go. There's so many little inlets and crannies and stuff that you can get away from all the big boat traffic, but you got to be able to move. So that'll be something that I'll, you know, be looking into, but at the same time, you know, I'm a big guy. I can, I can pad a little bit. I'm not afraid of a, a little workout. So yeah, for sure. Good. And you know, the other thing that's really cool about kayak fishing is all the different accessories for it. Yep. So all the different electronics you can throw on there and, and whatnot. So what are you, what are you thinking of starting out with your electronics? Well, uh, my wife just got me a new Vexlar FL 18, um, for ice fishing this winter, but, uh, you know, just with the, the fish at horse tooth, um, so many of them, you can, you can jig off the bottom with jigging spoons or jigging wraps or even, you know, plastics and stuff like that. So I think I'm going to probably end up rigging up, uh, some kind of fish finder with the, the ice fishing transducer that's held with some kind of PVC and, uh, you know, some boards that it sticks straight down in the water. So when I'm, when I'm, you know, in the, in the waves, it's not going to be, um, you know, getting turned around and everywhere where I can't see it. So I got a couple ideas up my sleeve and I've seen quite a few people online, you know, what they've done with their Vexlers on their kayaks before they got a normal fishing radar. Yeah. Just be, make sure you secure that thing up uh, pretty know. well. Cause that, that'd you know, be a huge loss. <laughs> monumental. Um, have you considered something like a, a deeper or a Vexlar ball or I think even um, Lawrence has got a, a, a wi- Wi-Fi little sonar ball? Yeah, I used to have a, a Vexlar teapot and that was really nice and everything. And, you know, it's just it's just the, the battery life of it and being connected to your phone. It was only about like five hours. and But that was when they first came out. So I don't know if they've gotten better. Um, but uh, the thing that I'm going to be going after um, is, you know, um, after I get my kayak this spring, uh, waiting till this fall for uh, Black Friday and going to Cabela's and places like that, you know, Jacks and Shields and stuff and looking for that stuff on the shelf that's 50% off because I know a lot of people find a lot of quality, quality equipment um, for sale on those type of days. And you can usually spend a lot of money on it when you don't need to. So. So while we're talking about sales, I actually was in Sportsman's Warehouse today looking for some uh, different uh, tackle container systems and stuff like that in Thornton. And at that location, they had a table in one of the aisles that they had a whole bunch of electronics, all sorts of different brands. I remember seeing like a Helix 7 to mount on a boat. I think there were some Lariance units there. And most of them were at least $100 off. So a little little bit of a find there. So if you're looking for electronics, maybe check that out and see if – yeah, definitely. Uh, for those folks that are listening and and whatnot, so that that could help somebody out. Is hundred 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 bucks is no joke. It's a lot of lures. So, and I mean, I've I've you know I've grown up in in a canoe with my dad and everything, going to the Boundary Waters in Minnesota, and so that was always something that was kind of in the back of my mind because you know if you're a bigger guy, you can sit in the middle, and then therefore you can have the whole boat to yourself. But if you want to go with a buddy, then you can just throw him in the front. Um, but, you know, I think just with mobility wise and, and with the winds that horse tooth can kind of experience sometimes, I think a canoe would be just maybe a little bit of the wrong bet. You know, a kayak would be a little bit more well suited. You know, I go back and forth with my wife on this all the time because right. she, she wants a canoe badly. And, I do too, but. And, and it, I think just being on the water is amazing and any way you can get on the water right. is great. But I think out of all the things you can get out on the water here in Colorado, the canoe and John boat are probably the two most unsafe uh, yep. with the winds that we have here. And like you hear about people dumping canoes all the time in the state. Yep. Was it just uh, two years ago? Um, I think uh, an older couple uh, rolled over in their canoe up at uh, Wellington Lake up by Bailey. Yep. And I think oh, the, yep. the I lady survived that. and the gentleman did not. Yeah, that's terrible. It was. And w- so – I had heard about that in the news and I went up like maybe a week or two later and I was fishing with a couple of guys from the Patriot anglers up there from the shore and we weren't catching much or anything, but we talked about it there. And then I came back and it was a few weeks later down the road that I heard that they found the gentleman's body, which I didn't realize he was in there that whole time. And even when we were fishing the lake, he was in there. 
And yeah. I was like, oh, that is so horrible. And I guess what it was is like um, they were the, – the lake, it was – I think it was springtime when this happened. It, yeah. I can't remember if it was spring or fall, but it was right before the thermocline change. And so when the thermocline changed, his body actually floated up to where they could find it. But when the water was still cold, it stayed down. Yeah. Um, so that, that's just a horrible thing. And so if you do have canoes and any watercraft, you should be wearing a, a life jacket, um, you know, even if it's – one of the, the the old classic ones, or if it's brand new, nice snazzy, you know, uh, self inflating one, have something on for sure. Yeah. So, and, oh, go ahead. No, and and that's a good point. Um, my my old roommate uh, in Gunnison, his his mom and dad were out on Grand Lake in a canoe, just to kind of you know near the islands there, or maybe it was shadow mountain yeah it was shadow mountain anyway i can't remember what happened but their dog they ended up tipping their canoe and their dog ended up getting sucked down somehow and died and drowned so i mean no matter how good of a swimmer you are dogs are probably better swimmers than most humans even even it can even happen to dogs so you know and that's why i seriously considered a kayak because i know you can get them with canoes but the stability supports on that um that go on the sides mm-hmm that's something that I've seriously considered too. Just, you know, a little extra. Yeah. Well, and I've seen some of those demonstrations with the Hobies and, you yeah. know, folks standing on them and fishing on yeah. them that way. So they, they look pretty stable. I'm pretty sure they're more stable than a canoe. So right. you'll have that going. Um, so while we were talking about horse tooth, they're in the news lately and it, it's, uh, there was just a big interview out it was the gentleman that was attacked by a mountain lion. And I know it's non-fishing, but you know, you're, you're in and around horse tooth all the time. I figured I'd get your thoughts on it and I'd make a few comments on it too. Cause that's kind of a pretty big deal. A mountain lion attack at one of these parks that we frequent. Yeah. I mean, um, it, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the outdoors many times. I've seen, I've actually seen multiple mountain lions in, in the wild. Uh, I think I'm on four or five, um, and that's something that a whole lot of people can't say. I've seen Canadian lynx. I've seen tons of moose. I've seen bears. Um, I've seen a lot of a lot of animals. So with that being said, you know, no matter what, when you're around wild animals, there's always a, a sense of unknown and and, uh, and danger. Um, so whatever happened with this guy, I don't. You know, I wasn't there. You know, I saw the pictures. I saw the videos and everything. I read read what he had to say, but. Um, you know, that it was pretty brave of him to do what he did, you know, and fight, fight the mountain lion off. But at the same time, you know, with, with the media and everything, the age we're, we're in, they're going to take a story and they're going to run with it. And, you know, everything I've seen on Facebook and, and all the other articles of people, you know, praising the guy, which is fine. You know, he did, he protected himself, but then, you know, going a step beyond that saying he should run for president and just, you know, different things like that. You know, it was, it just kind of bewilders me because if you really look into the facts of what happened in the story, the mountain lion was a cub. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't that old. Uh, it was, it was, I wouldn't even say it was over a hundred pounds. It was probably like 50, 60 pounds if that. So it didn't weigh that much. And, and you know, it, with any kind of um, younger animal, their their teeth are not going to be as established as a full grown. They're not going to be as strong. But you know, going back to what I just said, it's a wild animal. So yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm kind of caught in between. I think you know, my sister <laughs> my sister lives in Alaska, and she takes her dogs out for walks daily. And she she's run into situations where she's been inches away from being trampled to death by a moose, and people die every single year in the United States for moose. And I don't think that can be said about mountain lions. So I don't know. 50, yeah. 50. I, I would definitely say moose is even though it's not an apex predator, like a mountain lion is definitely no. the more dangerous animal. I would even say bears are probably more dangerous because they got a greater curiosity than, a, than a lion. Yeah. Um, and so, but lions are still apex predators. And yeah. you know, when it comes to cats, 
You know, if a, if a cat sees something moving, it likes to pounce sometimes. And so I could see how that could happen. But this right. sounds like that was not the case with this. It sounds like um, this cat was stalking the gentleman and he turned around and then the cat still came upon him, which, you know, when before I knew like the, the details, I was like, that cat is either really young and hasn't learned how to hunt yet or it is sick and or it's starving to death and it's desperate. I was like, right. this is not normal mountain lion behavior. They normally don't go after humans. Even like a runner or something like that is very unusual. So, but I, I will never um, dog somebody for defending their life. You know, the gentleman has a right to defend his life and he did. Um, and so, you know, the, the, there is that. But it's just, it's, you know, everybody's going above and beyond and like blowing this story up more than it really should be. I think personally, this guy should have probably won that fight, you know, with the size of the mountain lion. Granted, the mountain lion still has claws and teeth and all that and will really mess you up, but right. um, he, he probably should have survived that. Most healthy adult people probably should be able to fight that cat off somewhere, some form. Um, so, I mean, it is kind of what it is. Um, one thing, you know, a normal lion from everything that I've read and understand, you know, a small male lion is 170 pounds. That's a right. whole other ball game if you're getting attacked by a cat that size. And yeah. not only a cat that size has experience hunting too, and they don't go in to look to maul. From everything that I've read lately on mountain lions, and I even went to a little seminar here in Lions that they put on about them because they're all around us here at Lions, Colorado. I've actually fed one with my hands before at the mountain lion rescue here in Fort Collins. It was a yeah. full-size male. It was gigantic and they're all about stealth and then pouncing and they always aim for the neck to that, that quick net break or, or bite through the neck. And it's usually a quick thing. They don't look for these prolonged, like big fights and stuff like that, that, that I think people get in their head. So um, I, if there was an adult male that had come across that guy, I, I think it would have been a much different story. So right. I'm, I'm glad that he's okay. And I'm glad that he was able to defend himself. I do kind of feel a little bit bad for the lion, but, it's unusual. You would think that a lion that size would still be with its mother. So it makes right. me wonder what, what happened, um, you know, within that lion's family. So, so I'm, I'm looking at this just, just to add to this, I'm looking at this little, um, and I mean, everybody can find different kind of charts and stuff on any kind of website on the internet, but I just, you know, I've been looking through a couple different pages and I found, um, this, uh, this table here that has age and weight, per 12 months and uh, a 10 month year old mountain lion is only going to weigh 50 pounds. And that's a, that's a female, a, a male uh, 10 month is going to weigh around 62 pounds. And so, I mean, that's really, that's really not, not that big. And a, a 12 month year old uh, females, this says weigh anywhere from 50 to 80 pounds and the males weigh anywhere from 70 to 90 and I mean, like yeah. you're just saying, a 160 pound male, that's a small full grown male. I mean, that, that's something to really be reckoned with, but yeah. a smaller cat. But there's something definitely wrong with that situation. I mean, that, yeah. that, that cat must have been either sick, hungry. Um, you know, I think at 10 months, they should still be with their mother. I don't know 100% on that one. Right. Um, so it just sounds, it's just the whole situation sounds odd and it'd be great to know the full kind of scope on it before we totally Monday morning quarterback it. But I'm glad that the gentleman's okay. And, uh, you know, he's going to get some free beers out of it. So he's got that. So, um, all right. So I, I suppose, um, I, I've got a few things I want to talk about. I haven't been able to really do much fishing yet. I was wanting to get out this weekend. I should have gone Friday. This last Friday afternoon it was super nice, and then Saturday, Sunday got horrible, and I didn't feel like being in the cold or slipping on new snow or ice, so I, I just kind of kept it at home. And I've done a few things. Um, I've had a, a bent ego net. <laughs> yeah, don't get me wrong. My ego is just fine. But right. um, my ego net, um, not so much. A big spinny trout a, a few years back um, kind of I had it fully extended, and on those ego nets, they extend a long ways if people haven't ever used one. They're really awesome. They help increase your catch rate a little bit, I would say. And then you, it's easy to keep the fish in the water if you just want to unhook and, and release and, and keep fish swimming well. But um, I bent one on a big spinny trout, which I didn't think it would bend on, on those. I don't think it was that big of a trout, um, but it did. And so it wouldn't extend all the way or suck back in. And 
um, I've been meaning for a long time to call Ego and just see what they would do for me or how much it would cost for a replacement. And so I finally did that and it was free. They sent me a, a free handle, no questions asked. And so my Ego net is back in service. Um, so it, I just want to give a little kudos to Ego. So if you're in the, in the market for a net, um, I've had nothing but good things to say about this one, except for that one trout bending it. And they, I should have called a lot sooner because they would have replaced it and I would have been back in business a, a lot quicker. But just want to give some kudos for Ego. And then um, I've been, for the most part, just kind of getting ready for spring fishing. I've been yeah. uh, kind of reorganizing kits. And, like, I've got so many different styles and methods of fishing. And I'm actually – I always kind of rob from all my different kits to make up whatever kit I'm going to go with. And I'm kind of tired of that. I'm kind of tired of taking the time to, to sort through track tackle and say, I need this or I need that. And I want to try to minimize that. And, you know, I've got a float tube. I got the float pontoon. I do fly fishing. I do a lot of shore uh, and river fishing, you know, walking shorelines, uh, hiking into the high Alpine with camelbacks and fishing that way, uh, yeah. the boating and ice fishing. So I've decided that I'm going to start building kits for each one of them. And I'm starting with building a full out kit for my float pontoon, the Colorado XT I just got, and then building a kit for, for the boat. Cause my, I'm planning a huge big trip to Navajo this spring in May. So I'm going to, I've been working on those. And so slowly ordering some uh, gear off of Amazon, some new tackle and things like that to supplement and to at least trying to get my, my uh, key lures of, uh, in each kit as far as the tubes I like and right. the Z-Race and the, the jerk baits and, and all that stuff. And just to say, it's it's probably going to cost more money, but um, it'd just be nice not to have that hassle anymore. And I feel like I'm so disorganized when I don't have it. So that's really what I've been working on, man. And that, that's um, where I'm, that's where I'm pretty caught too, is in, is in between of, of what lures do I want to take today? Cause I'm going to list lake, but I only have this backpack and then I have to take stuff out of here to put in there and, so having multiple sets of those key lures and different kind of kits, so you wouldn't have to go to this lake's kit and pull up those two jerk baits and put them in this kit, you know? So I'm, yeah. I'm stuck in between. You know, and, and once you get that kayak, you know, you're just going to build out tackle for it and just leave it alone and not mess with it. And, yep. and, and then, you know, you'd have your little pack for when you, when you head up the trail. Yep. So, um, I don't know. It's probably an expensive avenue to go, but I'm always buying lures and, We'll just keep doing it until I get in trouble from the wife, which has not happened yet. So she's definitely a keeper so far. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, speaking of new um, new tackle, um, I've been I, I've been following um, this company called Moonworms. Yeah, out, out, and they're based out of California. I think I think they're out of Southern California, but I could be mistaken on that. And I was connected to them through. Um, uh, Oh, I can't even remember the name of that app. Total brain fart right there. But essentially, I was referred to Moonworm as far as a good quality um, tube. And I've been looking for different colors and different sizes and stuff like that. So I started following them on Facebook. And they've been uh, posting some amazing photos of some of their some of their tubes that they're, they're producing there. And I finally uh, reached out, talked to them, got the full scoop on them and whatnot. And he sent me a bunch of Moonworm tubes. And they sent me a huge box full of them. And I've got like, I don't know, 10 or 12 different colors of these. Like they're like two inch, I think maybe the two, two, I think they're two inch two. Yeah. The twos are the 2.5s. Yep. And they look absolutely amazing and I'm super stoked to use them. Uh, I'm thinking uh, I'm going to go trout, rainbow trout, ice off and just see how the trout just, I bet they just hammer them. And so we were talking before the show and you've actually been using them for a while. So you want to give us your thoughts on those, Tom? Yeah, I actually uh, heard of Moonworms through um, my friend Travis uh, Rorick, and uh, he, he's he been fishing them for a while, and I've been uh, fishing Moonworms for four years now. And uh, first uh, <coughs> was introduced to the Moon Mia, the, I think it's the five-inch, um, it's this, it looks like a little minnow with a tri-fork trail, and then this big round body, and uh it's it's probably one of the most impressive impressive uh, plastics I've seen that as far as glow that keeps glow and that glows up and, and is bright and uh, then I've also fished um, they're they're smaller uh, they call them exo bugs that's what they were I've fished their smaller exo bugs um, in in the 1.5 inch um, lengths and then 
uh, quite a few of their other other uh, different kind of plastics, some of their tubes. Uh, I mean, you name it, man. They make squids. They make just about everything, swim baits. And uh, I thought it was really cool um, because I caught, and still to this this day, I still have caught my biggest uh, Colorado black crappie um, through the open water on a on a moonworm exo bug. And uh, it's, it was like a charcoal with silver flake color on it. And uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't hit anything else except that moonworm. And there, I have tons of other pictures, you know, from uh, other fishing outings where. Uh, we were out on Blue Mesa ice fishing and uh, just fishing 120 feet for Lakers and nobody else was getting bites. And I'd, I'd send a, a glow moon, moonworm down there and just get hit right away. And I mean, they're excellent plastics. Not only is the the paint and the, the way they make them excellent, but I mean, I, I will speak for their durability. I cannot tell you how many lake trout I caught on some of those moonworms and they just would not break and they're they're excellent baits and and one thing that a lot of fishermen wouldn't think but one thing i found is that you can take moonworms and you can soak them in uh berkeley gulp juice and they will not deform their shape they won't do anything like that they'll kind of soak up some of the liquid and it'll make them even more even more dangerous so very interesting i'll have to throw the link up on the uh the info for this um radio show. So look for that down below and we'll be putting some other links as well for when we get further into the show, but it's good to hear they're durable. That was one of the questions I had. Um, I'm super stoked to use them. One of the things that really, why I wanted them because we got some, I mean, I love Berkeley's tubes and I love bio baits tubes and there's a lot of good tubes out there to choose from. But the thing is, is a lot of Berkeley's tubes are salted and scented and all of bio baits tubes are scented. And there's so many places in Colorado that's flies and yep. moves only that you can't use scents. But these yep. moonworms are long enough to be, for the most part, in a lot, not all the lakes, but in a lot of these waters, you might be able to use them because they're long enough and they're unscented. So it's yep. one of the key things that um, I was kind of looking forward to them. So I'll definitely be putting them to the test this spring. And and another thing too is even if, even if uh, you know, something like Delaney, if you're fishing out there, what was the length for plastics? Anything over three inches or anything over 1.5? I can't it's remember. 1.5. Yeah. So, and that's the cool thing about these moonworms is, is, uh, I think the, the small ones he does is 1.5 or 1.75, something like yeah. that, because I was able to use them and they're the ones that I didn't put in the Berkeley gulp because I got so many of them. You can kind of pick and choose what colors you want to do with what and where you want to put them. And they're just such a versatile lure. So. And you get a lot of them with teaser tails too, which I love teaser tails. I mean, yep. teaser tails are killer for trout. And so. one, one last thing I'll say about uh, moonworms is, I mean, for, for the product that you get, for the money you pay, you can honestly, in my opinion, you really can't find anything else um, in that caliber. They're just, the durability, like I said, they catch fish and uh, they're, they, they're good costs, so. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, and I will definitely fish them and get back with a little bit of um, my thoughts on them and how they worked. But I'll also see if I can't, they're mom and pop shop. I mean, these things are made in a garage from what I understand. Yep. So I will see if we can't get the gentleman who uh, runs this uh, Moonworms and see yep. if we can't get him on in a future episode here uh, to yeah. talk about a little bit. So he, he's a pretty cool guy to talk to. Yeah, I watch a lot of Bobby's videos on Facebook and uh, just the way he he – works as lures and paints and or not paints but pours all those plastics and stuff it's just absolutely incredible to watch he's a lot of talent so so we still have the the middle creek uh or the, the the middle boulder creek project and interview coming up but one real quick thing before we get to it is um through facebook and some connections i found out that cpw was having a round table meeting this week and that's on the uh the 20th and it's for Northeastern Colorado, which includes a lot of the areas we fish, John. Yep. Um, and it's going to be in Loveland at 6 p.m. So and I don't know if this is open to the public, and I don't know much about the roundtable. I do know that the that CPW does have a roundtable, and they have them um, throughout the year in different regions of Colorado where they bring together hunters and anglers um, 
to sit in and, and, and voice their concerns and, and give feedback to the CPW about what they're seeing and what's going on and the CPW asks them questions and, and whatnot. And so it's a lot of information flow. Um, and so these round table folks, you actually have to apply to be on the round table. It's not just anybody. Um, I've actually tried two years in a row now to get onto this round table as an angler and have not made the cut. So I'm not sure exactly what they're looking for. It might be that they want more hunting than fishing. I don't hunt as much as I used to. I'm mainly fishing now. So I don't know if that's hurting me. Um, but I do want to get to this round table. I do want to hear what, what's being said and see how they work. Um, so I'm going to try to find out more information. A, is it open to the public? And, and so if people can attend, I'm going to put that on, uh, on the Facebook page. So we're going to try to get this episode published in time. And then I will call CPW tomorrow and try to figure out what is going on with that and get information out because nothing was published on it. There was no press release, no nothing. It was just being kind of snuck by. Have you heard anything on it? Not, not at all. Nope. So, um, so I'll definitely get some more info on that and we'll leave it there for now. And it may be just one of those things. It's just the, the folks that, that applied and are accepted to the round table are the only ones invited and it's not a meeting that's open to the public. And I can understand if that's the way, why it's not published, but if it's the other way around, that meeting should have been published. Um, yeah, so, I agree. all right. So we'll be right back with uh, segment two. Well, welcome back to the second segment of the show. Um, Lewis Chapman here and uh, John Schneider's joining me on uh, episode 14. And so this, over the last uh, week and a half or so, I was able to, to get out on a big project that's going on in Boulder, on the, middle, on the middle portion of the Boulder Creek. And so this portion is, if you know Boulder, it's kind of, um, it's east of the foothills, up until maybe around the hospital, there's a bend with a railroad bridge. And so it's a nice section of the creek. And it's an area that I've been kind of seeing. And I've actually been fishing further east than that. And then I've been fish, fish, fishing further west because it's kind of an area, the Boulder Creek, that's really flat. And it's been kind of eh and not a whole lot of fish activity. And it even got worse during the floods. So it's something that I haven't really been around but i noticed back in november when i was going through the area i seen a lot of construction vehicles john moving around through yep. there and i seen them like hauling all this flood debris and all this old timber and old trees out of there and i said oh what's going on and so um i did some research and i found out that um trout unlimited the the boulder fly casters is the name of their chapter in that part of boulder and there's there's two trout unlimited chapters in boulder county and there's the northern and southern the northern one is saint Vrain. Um, oh boy, I, I don't want to mess it up, but it's St. Vrain something and it'll be in the interview. So just listen for it. And then yep. you have the Boulder fly casters on the, on the Southern side of it. Um, and so I reached out and I was lucky enough to, um, schedule and do an interview with Robert McCormick, who is the vice president of Trout Unlimited. And he really goes through and breaks down this, this big project on Boulder Creek where they're doing a big renovation and installing a lot of new fish habitat to make it an awesome part of the river, uh, which is a catch and release and flies and lures only. So I'm thinking here in the next few years, we might have some big trout in this area to catch. So um, without any delay, here is the interview. Welcome back to Vantage Fishing. Lewis Chapman here. And today I have got a special guest from Trout Unlimited, Robert McCormick. Um, and we're here to talk about a project going on uh, on Boulder Creek, um, so towards a little bit on the eastern side of Foothills uh, Parkway. Can you talk a little bit about the, the creek in, in that area for folks that don't know what we're talking about? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so um, I guess first uh, I'm involved with the, the Boulder Flycasters. I'm the, the current vice president, and we're uh, a chapter of Trout Unlimited in Boulder County, one of the two chapters in, in Boulder County, the other one being the the St. Brain Anglers, which are kind of Longmont and Lyons. We cover uh, essentially the rest of Boulder County from all the way up from the divide um, out east uh, until it hits the, the, the far plains. Um, and uh, we just completed a project on Middle Boulder Creek called the Flatirons Park Project, which is about three years in the making um, on the creek from uh, Foothills Parkway, essentially. Uh, down to the Burlington uh, Northern Santa Fe Railroad Bridge uh, below it. So uh, for those familiar with the area, it's the, 
area behind the hospital that has the bike path along it. Um, and there's a lot of tech offices and a big parking lot on the left there. Um, and that area of Creek was super flat, um, channelized to almost being as straight as an arrow and very over width, um, meaning that the, the, the Creek bed was wide and shallow um, for the amount of water that, that runs through there regularly. And it got even worse with the, the major floods we had in 2013. I was, um, was going to say, is this a, a big kind of renovation project from the floods or is this something that even needed to be done before the floods? It was on our target list before the floods. Um, and it just got far worse after the floods. Probably, probably the, the highest impact area um, on Boulder Creek outside of kind of where, where it really flattens out, um, out in the plains. Um, at least the, the urban is the urban area that needed the most work. It just got filled with sediment, um, being kind of the first area where the, the, the drop in the Creek, um, really starts to flatten out for three quarters of a mile or so. Gotcha. And, you know, and I feel, so, the- yeah, it, um, it's filled with, with sand, um, you know, coming all the way from, from the top of the drainage down, um, there and really compacted the earth. Um, the, the contractor that was working on the project uh, made some comments about how um, he hadn't seen much streams before other than in, you know, engineered areas and in the Denver metro um, that really weren't streams uh, that were so compacted. He was pretty amazed. Um, so they actually had to take the um, their equipment and, and dig up the stream bed in areas but they, where they weren't planning to just to kind of loosen and release some of that, that sediment and get some of it out of there. Wow. So with all that sediment that was covering up all the rocks, the boulders, any logs, all that stuff creating the great pools and everything that people look for, for that awesome fish habitat. And it just didn't exist then. Yeah, totally. There was about two pools on the Creek, um, in that stretch and, uh, uh, everything, everything else was pretty much just flat and, and straight and, um, pretty uniform habitat, uh, not very much oxygenation in the water. Um, the biggest, the biggest thing and the biggest concern, even before the flood, uh, with this area of the creek, but it, it got worse after, is just the lack of overwinter habitat. Um, when we get low flows in the winter, uh, those fish need pools and they need, uh, flow into those pools, uh, to keep them oxygenated. Mm-hmm. And there really wasn't any of that. Maybe one pool could, could host fish. Uh, in it over the winter, but for um, almost mile long stretch, that's pretty, pretty sad if only one little pool can hold it. And now I think we're pretty confident that essentially the whole entire reach uh, could support fish over the winter. So any fish that did survive in that area were pretty stunted and um, made for kind of poor fishing, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, it, they were, it was used really during the summer um, in those couple pools to, to ambush. And then there was actually some, some okay spawning habitat up at the, the front of the, the reach, which was the one area that there was a little bit of drop and a little bit of flow. Um, but now we've extended that all the way through. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more fish um, that are there year round uh, and, and um, should provide a lot more uh, numbers of fish because just because they'll be able to overwinter there. And we'll also see even more spawning uh, during the fall. Nice. Nice. And so primarily we're talking rainbow trout and brown trout. There's not too many other species right through there, correct? Yeah, there's a couple native uh, fish. Um, and forgive me, I don't really know the, the name of too many of them, but the flathead minnows in there. Um, I think there's a few stone rollers in there. Uh, and so the, chubs, that was a, yep, some chubs total. Yeah, so that was a concern of, of open space, of City of Boulder open space that we partnered with uh, to make sure that the habitat was conducive to the native fish species as well as the trout. Um, and they're, they're happy with that as well. Um, but yeah, it's primarily brown through there. Um, and I think we'll see, see a lot more browns, uh, hopefully some bigger browns and, um, a lot more spawning, uh, in there, which will be great. You know, um, this, the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so I live up in Lyons and I'm like, literally my backyard is the same rain up here. And mm-hmm. it, it went through a lot of what it's going through here. Cause after the floods, it was all sediment. It was, it was poor. I wasn't sure if any fish survived. And yeah. um, every year I go out there, I'm catching bigger and bigger Browns. So they're, they really took to it. So hopefully this will be the same results here. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. I think um, you know, um, the same rain, unfortunately, I think got the, the brunt of the storm and, um, 
fared a lot worse than than many other streams. Uh, Saint Brain and um, Big Thompson as well. Um, and Boulder Creek did did fairly well. Um, there's definitely some sediment buildup and some some movement of rocks and uh, some structure was was lost or moved. Um, but it, it wasn't it nowhere near as bad. Uh, and I think in the end, it's actually going to end up being better if we can, with the effect of the flood, kind of scouring the areas where there there it's steep and and there was flow, um, getting some of that that sediment built up just from not having high flows for a few years. Um, yeah. And then to have projects like this where where we're actively uh, restoring the stream, making it natural um, uh, like it was and, and getting that stuff that it compacted in and out. So it, it's a pretty actually long area where this is. I, I walked it just the other day and um, was taking some good photos, which I'll have up on the blog and I'll, I'll probably post a photo uh, along with the uh, podcast that folks can, can show on, see on that. Um, how long was the project area? The, how big was the scope of this? Uh, it was a, between three quarters and a mile um, or so. And it was um, $130,000 project. It looks like it'll be in the end. Um, with construction and, and permitting, um, so it was a big project. A big project for us. We try and do as a as a trial limited chapter. We try and do uh, one project over a hundred thousand dollars every two to three years, and at least a project or two under that every year. So this was kind of our big one uh, wow, that, for the last two years. That's pretty um, pretty amazing. Uh, the the amount of money that you guys are, are sinking into this. So is this all from member dues and, and donors and and things like that, or do you guys have partners that are involved with it too? Yeah. So what we're what we're really good at is is kind of bringing partners to the table. Um, so oftentimes we'll come up with an idea, or the Forest Service will come to us with an idea, or uh, the city or county open space will come with us come to us with an idea, um, and we'll either join in on a grant or, or in this case, we wrote a grant uh, and got some federal money through CPW uh, to kind of get the process started. Um, and then we got the city of open space on to help us out uh, and then fundraise. So the chapter fundraised a little over $35,000 um, for this project. Uh, and then we had uh, grant funding around 45 to $50,000. Uh, and then the city, uh, kicked in the majority of the rest of the, the money to do the project. That's great. And then, so it, back in November is when I noticed it was going on. I was seeing a lot of heavy machinery moving along the creek, clearing out timber and, and stuff like that. Um, can you speak a little bit to what kind of work was going in to, to clean this up and to clear this timber and all that? Yeah, so it was it was about a three-year process since we applied for the grant, and it was a fishing is fun grant, uh, which is U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service money. Um, that CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, administers um, for projects like this or for access projects. So some other projects um, in, in the area recently that we did with Fishing is Fun Money is uh, put in a belly boat ramp and uh, fishing pier at KOA Lake, uh, kind of in the same area there. You know what? Um, We've highlighted that but float tube ramp at KOA. We use it all the time. So thank you so much for that. That's kind of cool to have cool. that connection. A lot of our listeners, because we've talked to a lot about KOA, because it's kind of the, the bingo lake. You never really know what you're going to catch in there. It seems to hold everything. So um, Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah it's deep up. and it's cold, but it's, you know, it's got enough shallow and habitat for bass and carp as well. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Great. Yeah, no, it's an awesome, it's an awesome resource to have so close and down. Um, and that, yeah, I think, uh, a, a lot of fish species do really well in it. So what would you want, um, anglers to know about this section of Boulder Creek now that it's going to be kind of a little bit easier to access and there might be some more fishing pressure, uh, anything you want to put out as far as that? Yeah, the, I, I, it's still within the, the city of Boulder, um, catch and release. Um, so, uh, CPW, um, has, uh, restrictions on Boulder Creek from the mouth of the canyon. Um, out to, I think, 75th, um, where it's artificial flies only and uh, all catch and release. Um, so definitely be abiding by that. Um, one thing that we're a little bit concerned with, um, which is just kind of part of the, the process, is in adding structure and adding um, trees, uh, especially uh, root wads into the banks to kind of shore it up and, and also create deflectors and focus flow. Um, we're adding uh, things that are possibly could catch uh, trash 
And so while you're you're out there fishing and you see a root wad that's got plastic bags and other trash on it, um, you know, try and take that stuff out with you. Um, we don't want to don't want to end up uh, hurting the aesthetics, even though we're improving the habitat and being the urban fishery there. It does get a fair amount of garbage uh, floating through it. Um, yeah, and you know, we're we're hopefully going to see a lot more spawning in the fall in that area and. Um, if you start seeing trout getting on reds, and it will be pretty obvious there because uh, it's, it's, the gravel's pretty apparent, um, just leave them alone, let them do their thing, uh, and try and not to tromp through their, their reds after they're done, done yeah. uh, laying eggs. So you bring up the spawning. Um, is there a plan to uh, help them out with a, some additional stocking of either rainbows or browns? The state has considered throwing rainbows in. Um, they had the, the Hoffer strain rainbows they wanted to test out in there. I guess the, the water quality and the, the pH would be fitting for it. Um, as a chapter, we've kind of advocated, I don't want to say advocated, had conversations with, with our regional biologists about doing that. Um, you know, we think it's an excellent brown trout fishery and the browns really do, do great down there. Mm -hmm. Um, in 2013, after the flood, there was some stocking of cutbows in the creek, um, and there was a pretty good concentration of them down in that area. Uh, and at least, um, uh, at least, kind of, you know, by example and, and fishing, I think a, a lot of people noticed that it it did some impairment to the brown trout fishery, uh, and not many of those cutbows or any at all have survived. Um, yeah. So we're kind of hoping that the state the state lets it be and, and lets it kind of continue to develop into the great brown trout fishery it is. One thing we do see often is is some, some bigger fish in Boulder Creek, especially post-flood. We've seen bigger fish uh, kind of throughout the city. Um, yeah. And we think having more connected habitat like this between uh, kind of the, the mountainous part and out by the plains um, will keep those, those fish kind of moving and using the whole entire system, um, which will facilitate fish getting bigger and bigger. Um, so I don't think it would be the worst thing to have rainbows in there, but um, hopefully hopefully we kind of let, let it be with the browns. And it's actually really awesome and, and fortuitous that CPW had done some testing of the stretch before we got the equipment in. Um, so we'll be able to benchmark kind of pre and post project um, exact numbers of fish in that stretch and size that's great yeah uh, so i mean i would personally love to keep it browns browns are, are gorgeous especially when they get spawning and they're fun fish um they're they're great fighting fish but and you you bring up the the hoffer strain of the rainbow and for folks that might not necessarily know what that is so it's a I'm not exactly sure of the history or origins of the trout, but I know that it is whirling disease resistant. And that's one of the reasons CPW is looking at it and they've actually mm -hmm. put it up in Dillon and uh, just to see how it is, is going there for, I think it's been in there for almost a year, maybe a year and a half. And it's a pretty resilient um, strain. It's the only strain so far in Lake Dillon that, that a lot, you know, large numbers of trout stocked in the fall that have actually made it through the winter that are actually finding the mycy shrimp in that lake. And so they're, pretty good predators and they're pretty on it with figuring things out so it'd be interesting to see how that would impact the browns because i don't i think that it's definitely putting them like a, a more higher end of rainbow that's able to take care of itself a little bit better yeah yeah definitely definitely so. yeah I, I, I from what i've heard i think that they're the same ones they've been putting in the arkansas of recent and then from fishing the arkansas you definitely see more and more healthier and and it seems to me at least to be a far spunkier uh, fun rainbow to catch. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's all, that's all great stuff. Awesome. Well, um, so as far as, um, the Boulder fly casters and trout unlimited, if anybody wants to get involved with that, how would they go about that? Yeah. So we meet, uh, from September through May, uh, and have public, uh, chapter meetings open to the public, um, on the last Wednesday of each month, uh, starting at like 6.30, 7 p.m. at um, Upflow uh, Brewery off 55th in Boulder. Most often, sometimes we try and head out to East County um, at least once or twice a year for a meeting out there um, at a different brewery or, or Mud Rocks. We usually try and 
impair beer and meeting and those those fishing those are those meetings are um usually about three quarter fishing topic uh and then a quarter conservation topic but also just a, a good spot to meet uh other anglers and conservationists uh and learn more about what we've got, got going on um boulderflycasters.com uh, is our website uh and you can find us on facebook um at boulder Flycasters and instagram as well uh, and then if you want to join the board, we're always looking for new board members. Um, and we meet the first Wednesday of each month in Superior. Um, and uh, just reach out to to anyone via Facebook or email or, or Instagram um, about that. But we're always looking for, for new board members and folks to get involved that are interested in, in conservation access, um, youth education. Um, those are kind of our, our big things, but especially conservation and restoration. Our, our chapter really focuses on that. That's awesome. Do you guys have any uh, future projects or cleanups coming up this spring or summer that you might need help with? Yeah, so we're, we're going to do some planting on, on this stretch, um, most likely um, probably before runoff if it's looking good. Um, so we'll have that uh, up on the website when we're going to do that. Um, just willow staking. There's a lot of uh, non-native crack willow in there, so we're going to try and reintroduce some native species um, back in the area. Um, and then we just won uh, a large grant um, with uh, um, the Colorado Water Conservation Board uh, to do a years-long study on uh, South Boulder Creek from the El Dorado ditch um, all the way to behind the Toyota dealership where it meets the cell canal. Um, so we'll be doing a lot there. Um, some citizen science work with with monitoring um, and then just kind of trying to build a better uh, data set and baseline data on South Boulder Creek um, just because there's not much really known about it or what's known is is in kind of separate silos um, and we see a lot of potential changes uh, to the creek and and how it's managed in the future and we just want to make sure that that everything gets done that happens in the best interest of the creek and um, hopefully can improve the fishery there. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, um, th th this is amazing, you know, seeing the before and after on this, and I'm sure the fishing is going to be, be just as great leading into the future. And it, I see some great bends in there and some, some good uh, structure that I think after a couple good spring runoffs, they're going to develop some really nice pools and some great areas to, to fish. So just, uh, Keep in mind, everybody, that this is a, a catch and release, flies and lures only area. So, you know, be kind. I'll leave that resource for other anglers and uh, for future generations and whatnot. Um, any last comments? Why I uh, have you on, Robert? No, thanks. No, it's uh, it's great to hear from other anglers that they can already see kind of the the, the work that was done there. Um, you know, that I, I think there's. Uh, something very important as a, a, a fisherman. Um, that you start to learn the more and more you get involved in the sport and you start thinking about ecology and, and uh, that, you know, plays heavily into where you fish and how you fish and what you fish. Um, and so it's great to, to hear from another, other angler that they, they can notice that the stream is, is actually a stream again and not just kind of the highway to transport water. Um, yeah. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for spreading the word about our project. And uh, if any listeners are out there, uh, we'd love to have you get involved. For sure. And we'll post up, I'll uh, post up links to uh, your website and, and make sure that it's easy access for folks to get there after hearing, uh, hearing this uh, um, uh, segment of the, the show. So thanks again for coming on and uh, hope to have you on on future episodes. Cool. Thanks a lot. Great interview with uh, Robert McCormick. I can't thank him enough for, for joining me. Um, he answered a ton of questions and, and learned so, so much. And it's kind of excited. Like, um, you know, as we were saying before, John, it's, it's going to create a lot of habitat for a lot of new fish and, and potentially yeah. a lot of brown trout. Now you've done a little bit of work, so you might be able to speak to this. You've, you've worked on the pooter install and fish habitat. So what's all, what, what's all involved with that? Well, a lot of it, um, you know, the fish have to have, you know, a, a good solid bank system in order for, you know, a lot of sediments not to be, wash away when there's high rains and so that's where it first starts and so near the watson state fish hatchery here in fort collins um a couple years ago we helped uh tu and then also colorado parks and wildlife uh do a bunch of uh 
fish habitat rehabilitation there when when the floods wiped it out and we took a bunch of uh oh come on now uh the plants near the the edge of the water like uh moose eat them a lot willows we took a yes. lot of willow shoots yeah. and, and uh had them cut off and then just plugged them in the ground and and i came back there a couple of years later and i couldn't believe it but the willows had grown in and uh, the ground and the bank was all just pretty solid and rocky and it looked great. And uh, just to see, you know, some of that work done, you know, to, to benefit the fish that are down there is really cool. And I kind of liked what you said um, before that interview about, about how that, that area that they're working on um, for the new fish habitat on the South, on the South Boulder uh, or on the middle Boulder Creek. Um, how it's catch and release because, you know, thinking a lot about Minnesota and, and how they kind of do their fishing down there, there's seasons, you know, to take fish and in Colorado, there's really not a whole lot except for minimum size requirements. And, and so something that I'd like to see a lot more of is a lot more catch and release areas um, just to catch big fish, you know, because a lot of people like to catch big fish, but a lot of people don't get the chance to catch big fish. And so, more yeah. years like that, you know, I think would really be beneficial to Colorado and, and CPW. You know, especially when it comes to fishing in the creeks and rivers in the state, because um, they can't handle the pressure as much as the lakes can. And, and they're not as easy to stock and, and fish have a harder time surviving in rivers. There's, sometimes there's not as much food and um, they have to put forth a lot more energy to get food in the rivers. And so it, it's nice to see some protection on them. You're right. And, um, I've actually witnessed that firsthand, like like we mentioned in the, the interview, uh, with the St. Rain here in Lyons coming through, and that was just completely wiped out by the flood. And I wasn't sure if it, I thought it was going to be years and years and years until there was good fishing here in Lyons. And, um, you know, they came through with all the backhoes and they did all the restoration and they, yeah. they made some awesome pools and some awesome habitat throughout the, the town of Lyons and through our parks going up the mountain a little bit. And it's all catch and release flies and lures only. And we're already seeing big fish. I mean, I've caught rainbows above 16 inches. I'm starting to get bigger and bigger browns every year. Um, I have not seen a photo, so I'm, I can't, you know, say it's true. Um, but there is rumors that there was a 23-inch rainbow caught in town this, this past summer. So uh, a lot of key signs that this kind of stuff works. So I'm excited that that. that Trout Unlimited is doing this type of great work um, for Boulder. And, and Boulder Creek is a very popular fishing area. Um, there's it a is. lot of fly fishermen, and, and a lot of people spin spin fish it too. So uh, it's something I like to do. I usually will take an ultralight and a, and a five weight down to Boulder Creek when I fish it. And and I like to, to kind of hit it in the, the spring and fall when it's a little bit more quiet and there's probably not as many people on the trails, and, and the trout usually are biting a little bit better. But uh, it's always a fun, uh, neat thing to do, and it's something you can link in with some pond hopping because there's so many ponds in and around Boulder. So it can make a great day of, of fishing multiple different waters. So it, right. it's just good to see that kind of work. And um, so one thing I, I did want to bring up, and I'm going to try to get really involved with it, and I welcome you too, John, if, you, if you're willing. But um, try to, I, I learned – after this interview, um, talking with Robert via email a few days later, that there is, in fact, another project coming up, and he mentioned this stuff in the, in the interview, but an additional one from what he mentioned. Uh, they're, they're potentially looking at uh, opening up a pond here in Boulder that I think is Boulder Park and Rec, and I've never been to the pond, and I think I know where it's located, but it's it's called Pond D, and it's an old construction pit, and I think it's out near this, the Sawhill Ponds, if you know where yeah. those are out on the east yeah, side of town. Of. And essentially, they want to open that back up and put a uh, float tube ramp as well as a fishing pier on the lake. And so they're looking for some um, collaboration. And so I'm linking them up with the Patriot Anglers, and I'm going to try to help do some grant writing and as well as put the gloves on and help build a little bit of that and get some veterans in work uh, to work on it and in collaboration with Trout Unlimited. So if there's anybody out there that's willing to help out on that, you can always reach out to us here at Vantage Fishing, and, and uh, maybe we can. Uh, do something a little good and then give back to our fishing community. Yeah, totally. So. And, just, and just one thing, uh, last thing I'd like to hit just cause I feel like, you know, catch and release is kind of a, a sensitive subject for some people. Um, one, one thing that I, I learned this ice fishing season from, uh, ice fishing pro Eric, and I'm going to, I'm going to totally kill his last name, but Eric Hotjada. 
Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of him, Lewis, but uh, mm. he's a he's a big ice fishing guide, uh, ice team clam member out of uh, oh boy, I'm, I feel horrible, but I I follow his Facebook and he fishes Milwaukee Harbor, um, and he caught the same brown trout three different times, and this thing. I can't remember the size or whatever, but the fish in Milwaukee Harbor are huge. And I, if I if I'm right, this thing was like twenty, just huge, like twenty pounds or something like that. And just you know, to the people who say catch and release doesn't work on big fish, it works. And if you do it the right way, if you educate yourself, and if you watch videos on how to properly do it, you can almost almost always make sure that fish goes back alive. Yeah, I. Totally agree with that. And I have seen those videos. Um, They're easy to find on YouTube. Just Google them. And they're pretty amazing. Uh, He does uh, a lot of that with the automatic fishermen too, if I'm thinking right. Yeah, I've seen those. They're really cool and they're gorgeous fish. So definitely some videos to watch. Um, So, but, um, you know, as Robert was saying in in the interview, um, there's a, Trout Unlimited could use some help. You know, whether it's volunteering to, to work out on the river and the, the ponds and lakes in Boulder or um, working as a board member. But Trout Unlimited um, is not the only one. There's actually a lot of different fishing organizations out there, charities, that uh, could use a lot of help. You know, the Patriot yeah. Anglers. Um, there's just one day. I know Denver Parks and Rec. And there's so many more out there that uh, do a lot of great things, a lot of bass clubs and stuff like that. So if you got a little bit of free time and you're huge into fishing, I'd say at least check it out, you know, maybe go volunteer for a day or go hang out with some of these folks for a day and see what you think. Um, Cause they could always use a hand. They, they really can. They do a lot of good things. They get a lot of people into fishing and they do a lot of great conservation work. So um, I think uh, when that segment on that note, unless you have anything else to add, John. No, I'm pretty good. Okay. Well, let's move on to segment three about Splake. We'll be right back. Welcome back to segment three of Vantage Fishing Radio. Um, here with John Schneider, Lewis Chapman. And I've been seeing, uh, I don't know, over the past week or two, I've seen at least three or four different photos people posting on Facebook of post uh, catching some nice splake and putting it up there. And I was like, that, that'd make a great segment just to talk about that fish a little bit. And I've got a few stories, and I imagine you two, you do too, John. Wow. Um, so if you're, if you're ready, I'd love to dive in and just – Let's break down this fish from at least what I know. Yep. So, splake are a hybrid fish, and we have a lot of hybrids in Colorado, like tiger musky, tiger trout. I'm sure, like wiper. Um, splake is one too, and splake is a hybrid of a lake trout and a brook trout, and so they're both char. And so, when we're talking trout, I don't know why they have trout at the other names. Do you? No, I don't. Because they're actually in the char species, so it should be like a lake char or a uh, um, a brook char, but uh, no, it's lake trout and brook trout. And so it's a crossbreed of those two species. And a lot of times it's, it's a stocked fish that is being made in hatcheries, but it can happen in the wild and, and, and does here in Colorado to where a, a laker in, in Granby or – Blue Mesa or wherever you might have lakers can meet up with brookies in some of these streams and creeks and rivers that feed into these lakes. And there'll be, uh, you know, a cross between, between the fish. And so it's kind of cool. The state actually uses splake. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's more of a species to, they actually use it to control brookies a lot. And a lot of yeah. lakes that get run wild with brookies to where there's so many brookies. And I think we've all fished these lakes to where you go there and you're catching brookie after brookie after brookie. You probably don't even need bait, but none of them are bigger than like six to eight inches. And so that lake is stunted and there's so many brookies in there that there's not enough food to allow them to grow any larger than what there are. It's, they've maxed that ecosystem. And so they put uh, predator fish in there to c- kind of control it. And so a lot of times they'll either put tiger trout, or they'll put splake in the lakes to help control brook trout. Um, you have anything to feed off of on that, Ron? Um, not really. Uh, yeah, you covered it. Gotcha. So um, 
Yeah, and so that's where a lot of times you can catch them. So, um, you, and you can find out where splake are by just opening up the Colorado Fishing Atlas. Um, I, I Google search a lot. Like I always, one of my key things when I Google search a lake is I always put up its uh, either stocking report or gill net survey. Like I will Google Lake So and So gill net survey. And it's usually a PDF with a pop-up. It'll give you the latest year that there was a survey that was published. And you can find out how many splake or, you know, how many brook trout and things like that are in a lake. And that's how I've identified um, whether splake are in a lake or not. And now I've actually only gone fishing one time. Um, I've gone fishing for splake many times and not caught any. But I've only gone fishing where I've planned to catch splake and caught splake one time. Most of the time when I catch them, it's by accident. Um, have you actually targeted the species, Sean? I never have, but just like you said, I've always caught them on accident and, uh, in the weirdest places. Yeah. And, and so, well, you know, and let's back up a, a note. Just, I think one of the biggest things with Splake is I think a lot of people have probably caught them and not even known they've caught them. And right. because they can look close to a lake trout and they can look awfully close to a brook trout. And sometimes they're like right smack in the middle. And, yeah generally they can grow pretty large, not quite as large as, as a lake trout, but they can get up there and it's not uncommon to have a splake in Colorado reach 20 inches. That's, that's something that happens. And, and sometimes they'll get over that. Um, and so, but if you catch a, uh, something that looks kind of like a laker, but kind of looks like a brookie and it's not as big as a laker, it's probably a splake. And one of the key identifying factors in a splake is actually, um, they'll have that forked tail where the brookies will still have more of a square tail. Cause a lot of times they'll have the same markings as a, a brook trout and they'll even have the orange fins with the, the white highlights, but it's the tail that will really give it away. It's the yeah. remember, it's a forked for a splake and, and the squared off for the brook. And if you look at some of the photos, we just shared one on vantage fishing, but unfortunately I think the angler who caught it was hold, um, holding the tail. So you can't see it. So I'll see if I can't publish a couple photos of, of splake. So you can see what I'm talking about that forked versus uh squared off tail. And, and I think that'll help a lot of people identify them, but um, going a little bit more into splake, they grow fast. They actually grow faster in brookies or Lakers, yeah. um, but they don't get as big as Lakers and they are pretty aggressive and they're going to hunt down it and, and mainly devour those smaller brook trout. And which is great because it'll allow the brook trout that don't get eaten by the splake to grow to larger sizes because they will have more to eat. Um, and so it'll be, it'll be good. And there's a few lakes that I think where we can get record, um, brook trout, you know, uh, that I think that if you keep fishing, you can definitely catch big brook trout in that are up in the Indian Peaks wilderness and in some other areas that if you look at the stocking reports, I'm not going to give away exact spots, but they have splake and they have brook trout. Just look for them. And uh, I think you can find big, big fish there. So just a little tip on that. But um, yeah. And any comments or any other facts that people have about splake, bring it in. Um, we just are kind of talking about it off the cuff a little bit. Um, and John, you said you had an experience where you caught a splake out in the middle of nowhere where it was not yeah. expected. Do you want to jump into that? Uh, yeah. I mean, I was pretty much trout fishing um, at my, one of my favorite holes right before Three Rivers Resort in, uh, in Almont, Colorado. And I stopped there on the side of the road and started fishing. And all of a sudden I caught, you know, something pretty big. And uh, uh, ended up getting up to the shore and it was a 2.5 pound splake. And, uh, I was from, from the mouth of, or from the, the start of Blue Mesa Reservoir, I was 19 miles up river, um, probably less than a mile away from the confluence of Coal Creek and, uh, uh, the Gunnison River there. And, uh, I mean, I'm telling you, it was, it was incredible. Uh, just seeing a fish that far up there. So uh, I haven't caught a whole lot. That was probably one of the few that I've caught, but um, I definitely know what it was because I took the picture to our local fish biologist there in Gunnison and he said it was a splake. So, Wow. Nice. And it's that far up the river. So that's a fish mixing with, with the, that's a brookie in the river mixing with a lake trout out of blue Mesa, right? Yep. A female lake trout. Uh, crossing with a male brookie. So. And, and there are not splake stocked into Blue Mesa. Is that correct? I do not believe so. so I think 100% there's only natural. Yeah. That, that's really cool when that happens. So, I, and I think I have one of those as well. Um, 
And I caught it back when I was first learning about spike. So I'm not a hundred percent whether it was a spike or not, but I, I, I do feel like it was. And so I was fishing the Colorado river just South of Rocky mountain national park up by Granby. And it was North of Granby uh, on the, and the river feeds right into Lake Granby from there. And obviously Lakers can go up the river, but it, I was quite a bit ways up and we're talking a lot of obstacles and, and things like that in between and, and some shallow parts. And so I'm not sure how far Lakers will go up a river. Maybe that's a good question for a biologist in a future episode, but yeah. I caught, what looked kind of like a lake trout and later I identified as a splake, pretty sure um, in the Colorado river in this little pool um, off of some willows, not too far from a moose. And he was just a little guy. I'd say he was like maybe 10, 12 inches. So not that big for a splake um, and released him back there. And I was like, wow, that was a really cool catch. It's something I was totally not expecting. And again, there's no splake in Lake Granby that I know of. Um, right. So that is definitely a natural fish. And, um, Getting to another story where I ran into Splake was actually at Antero. And there are Splake in Antero, um, not caught very often in there. Um, and I don't even know if you can still fish this way in Antero. So, um, and maybe I was wrong by fishing this way when I did it back in the day, but this is maybe six, seven years ago. Might have even been a little bit longer. But we used to ice, uh, ice fish Antero at night. And I don't think you can do that anymore. Um, maybe so, another thing to look into. Um, so if you get the idea that you're going to go ice fish and tarot at night for spike, please look into the regs before you do it. Cause I don't know if it's possible anymore. Um, but so we would go out and find some cuts in the weeds way out in the lake. And I get there with some buddies at like three in the afternoon, um, before sunset, walk out to, you know, spots that we knew that held pretty, pretty good fish. And we would throw up the shelter and we drill our holes. And then I would drill two extra holes on either side of the shelter. And I had these floating like headlights that, that fit perfectly into like a, a 10 inch hole. And they would illuminate everything underneath the ice. And it would be like these giant bug lights. And you'd see all these little minnows and all the scuds and all the little creatures in Antero coming off the weeds towards these lights. And we would, <clears throat> during the daytime, catch cut bows and rainbows. But as soon as that sunset and those lights popped on in the same spot, it was brown after brown and splake after splake. And they come wow. hammering and they come through like rockets, just like just hammering everything underneath and mostly eating all the stuff that's not on your hook. But every once in a while you, you, you nail one. And I think that the, one of those nights, I think we got like five or six splake above 18 inches out on Antero doing that um, just on little tube jigs and stuff. And wow. so that, that was really, really cool. Um, and you know, I'm not sure why Splake were in Antero. I know Antero's always dealt with a horrible population of suckers. So I don't know if that's something they put in there to help deal with, uh, you know, the sucker fry and stuff like that when they're smaller, but, uh, they're definitely in there and they probably haven't been stocked in a long, long time. So if the Splake that are still in there are probably getting pretty big, um, knowing that lake. So something, something kind of cool there. Yeah, that's really cool. So, um, uh, and I'll look into that ice fishing in Antero night because that, that really is a trip I'd love to reproduce sometime in the future. Although, talk about cold. You think it's cold during the daytime? No, I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's yeah, I think we only lasted until like two or three in the morning. And then when you come out of the shelter, it's like pitch dark. And there's no lights in Antero, like any direction you look when you're way out in the lake. And so, you know, if. It, we still had footprints in the snow and stuff like that to get back and follow back. But man, if the wind had blown those over or something, I don't know. It was very disorienting coming out of the, the shelter after being in there all night um, and not having <laughs> any lights or anything like that. So something to be aware of if you try something like that. Yeah. Um, all right. So that is kind of what I have on, on Splake for tonight. Um, Maybe we'll do a little bit more research in the, in the future and get a little bit more into the biology of them. But uh, definitely a fun species to catch, a little bit on the rare side. So if you got some stories, got some photos, please share them with us. We'd love to see them. You got anything else to add on that one, John? Not really. No. Sweet. So, well, before we wrap up, we got some teasers for some future shows. Can't make any promises on what shows they'll be in, but we're going to definitely try to cover some of this content. I see that you got some on the notes. John, do you want to go over yours first? Yeah, um, you know, this is going to be the uh, spring season where I'm going to try and up my personal best uh, smallmouth of 19 inches and try and get something a little bigger. Um, you know, the 
the ice out opportunities up in North Park. Um, you know, it's been a little bit quiet for you and I, Lewis, the last month or so with the ice, but uh, we still got plenty of ice to go for the next, you know, couple of weeks. And uh, the high country ice out is going to be really good. So I'm going to be trying to get up to the North Park and hitting that. And then uh, last but not least, uh, my favorite time of the year, and it's not Christmas time, uh, but the spring smallmouth spawn at Horsetooth. Um, just absolutely crushing fish all day and uh, watching them go home just as happy as I am. So, so about when in the spring is that generally? Because uh, I'd be curious. Um, I, generally, I generally don't see uh, – it's, it's all about the water temperature, and I'm – uh, I haven't really dialed it in a hundred percent yet, but I believe it's around 50 to 55 degrees is when they start getting on their beds. I could be wrong. I'm probably wrong, yeah. but I know the dates is always from about the first to second week of May is when it starts. And then it goes full force into the end of May. So you have about a two to three week chunk that you can just crush fish. And uh, it's good in between or before and after. So you have, you know, more or less six weeks. Um, but it's my favorite time of the year. So, so while hey. you're doing, while you're doing that on horse tooth, I'll be doing the same thing down at Navajo because I'll be hitting them. And I have actually the last two years I've hit the small mouth spawn at Navajo right at full force. And it's, it's something that's amazing. Um, I've yeah, never that seen. That sounds amazing. I'd love to join you. Oh, hey, you're more than welcome. Yeah. Bring, bring a tent and a sleeping bag. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be getting into talking about Navajo in future episodes too. That's definitely going to happen. And, um, spawning smallmouth are, are, are pretty fun to catch. It's pretty aggressive. Um, so that yeah, it's definitely, I look forward to that. So uh, again, we got our St. Vrain fishing experience coming up. Um, that is going to be in March. So be on the lookout for that. And as we get closer, we'll talk more about, uh, the state park there and, and fishing there and getting more into it to the experience and the event that, that they put on, which is a really good one. But uh, one thing I'm really looking forward to fishing wise, which we are just weeks away. And I've been seeing a lot of posts by James Trujillo, Mr. Walleye himself, uh, that spring walleye bite is almost here. And I thought it was going to be, you know, we might be getting walleye really quick because those lakes are starting to come uncapped until this latest cold front. But um, uh, we're just weeks away and, Next week, I will be cleaning up the boat and prepping it for that spring walleye bite. Nice. And I've been talking to John, and I think – or no, excuse me. Holy – why did I do that? <laughs> I've been talking to James. Um, my apologies, James. But hopefully we're going to have him on the show in the next week or two. Um, and he is a great person to talk to about walleye. I don't know anybody that can outfish him for walleye from the shore. Um, it, it's something, uh, something special there. So definitely a must-listen show if we can get him on. And then uh, the next thing that I'm going to be going to later in the month that I'm looking forward to is Rep Your Water. They've got their warehouse in Boulder, and they do a lot of events there and stuff. But they're having a movie premiere um, of a fly fishing movie. It was at the um, Crosswaters, a, a Riversmith Originals. So I'm going to be going to that. So if anybody wants to come join me, uh, it's going to be a good time. I think everybody gets at least one free beer. And plus they've got a million great hats and like, I'm always yeah. looking to add another rep your water hats, my uh, little stickers collection. Yeah. So something, you know, if you're feeling the bug and, and uh, you want to get out for a night and beer and hang out with a bunch of other fishermen, uh, I, I'm going to be there. So, and I've shared that on the Vantage Fish, Fishing Facebook page and I will share it as we get a little closer to. So if you're looking for those event details, then there's that. And, uh, Again, I will put all the links from this show below um, when we get it published so you can easily navigate this stuff. And before we wrap up, John, uh, you have anything else you want to add in general about anything in the show? Uh, not really, except uh, I just want to get out fishing, and uh, I'm sure everybody else does too. So, Yeah, me too. It, it's been a long drought, and I should have went Friday, and I'm kicking myself. Yep, and so uh, I might try to sneak out at some point during lunch or – in the evening this week, if, if I can find the time and if the weather breaks a little bit, we'll see. I think lakes are recapping. Yep. But, um, yeah. Well, if you've enjoyed or found value value in uh, the show or any of our blogs, please like and share them. Spread, spread the joy. All our content is free. Um, if you have something to add or any comments or anything like that, or if you want to come on the show or write a blog, give us a shout. Uh, we'll always entertain that and uh, fight the skunk. <laughs>